Walking Blind is hosted by overly emotional dudes who overthink and overanalyze everything. Nothing the hosts say should be taken as medical advice or opinion. They're not professionals, and they're about to make that very clear. So just kick back and hang with them, because you've earned it. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Walking Blind Podcast. This is episode 54, and... You might notice something a little different. I'm Mike, and this is, uh, this is, is, yeah, it's just me. I'm by myself right now. But it's just the intro. I promise Mike Perez, the other Mike, is also on this episode as well. Because this week, we got to sit down and talk to our boy, Daniel Rinaldi. Now, Daniel is the lead singer for Bed Light for Blue Eyes. Also has some side projects and, uh, and some, uh, some solo music out there. Also uh, happens to be a clinician and licensed therapist. Uh, so we get to sit down with him, talk about mental health, talk about his new project, Mind Noise, uh, and then also get to talk about like the good old days of Trust Kill Records and uh, being kind of, you know, the poppy band on the label. Um, you know, all that and more in this episode. I just wanted to touch base because we got so caught up talking to him that we forgot to record the intro for this. And now here I am alone in a room by myself. And it's kind of weird. It's a little, it's a little strange, but check it out. We love you guys. We will talk to you guys soon. Uh, yeah, check 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 it out. Come come hang out with Daniel. Let's go. So my name is Daniel Rinaldi. I used to sing in a band called Bed Light for Blue Eyes that was signed to Trust Kill Records, and I am currently a mental health counselor in Massachusetts. And I don't really do music that much anymore, but I'm slowly starting to fuse music and mental health together to kind of create a a brand and an outlet for people like me that have the same story as me to kind of, you know, fi find a good uh, path to uh, carve out for themselves. That's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you, you know, you kind of say you don't do music, but we did just hear that, that, uh, solo single that you, that you put out, you know, <laughs> I was like, okay, I like this. I like, I like this a lot. Dude, you know? did, uh, did, did you catch the, what I say? This, does that make sense? Cause I feel what? embarrassed now if I say it now out loud. What? <laughs> what I text you when I heard it, I was like, dude. <laughs> Oh yeah, he was he was saying I'll I'll say it for you. Okay. Like there's there's a lot of this gear. A, mind you, this is a big compliment because <laughs> the person who I compared you to is big amongst our friends. So <laughs> so okay. So uh, there he he was like, man, I'm getting real major like David Archuleta vibes from this single. Okay, uh, and I was like, yeah, dude, I can hear it too. <laughs> um, but so so I kind of want to like go from there and kind of rewind a little bit. Um, so I know that you you had uh, you had said that you were um, involved with Bed Life for Blue Eyes like right around two thousand six, end of two thousand six, early two thousand seven. Mm -hmm. So um, before that though, like I kind of want to take it back. Like what what was it that got you into like you know rock and roll, punk rock, um, you know stuff like this? Like what's your history and background? So the the story of me joining Bed Light is a is an interesting one. Um, it was kind of like a the like the rock star moment for me, like as far as like the movie goes, right? Mm -hmm. um, I was never really into rock music growing up. Okay. Um, I grew up listening to what my dad listened to, um, soul music. I was a giant like Steely Dan, Hall & Oates fan. Um, I loved that R&B and soul stuff, uh, um, Temptations, you know, a, a lot of that. Oh. And um, in high school, I did theater. Um, I went to a performing arts high school, so I did vocals and theater there. Um, and then I had a friend, um, Mark, who was like, hey, man, like, you kind of sound like this singer of this band. I'm going to see them at um, CBGB's in Manhattan. Do you want to come with me? And I was like, I don't know, man. Like, it's not my thing. It's not my, it's just not my music. I was later on in high school, I was really into hip hop. So like I was right. huge, you know, I grew up in New York city, so mm, yeah. I was huge into hip hop. I love Nas. Nas is still my favorite, yeah, yeah. um, MC of all time. And 
I took a chance and, and ended up going. Um, I believe it was, it was Bell Light for Blue Eyes, a band called Roses Are Red, a band called Bleed the Dream, and a band called The Confession, which mm-hmm. I believe The Confession were out of California. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but went to see them, saw <clears throat> Bell Light for Blue Eyes, and was like, oh my goodness. Like, who's this dude singing? This is fantastic. Like, I need to listen to more. So I bought the album, couldn't put it down. All of a sudden on MySpace, because that was big then, <laughs> um, I see a, a bulletin go out that says, we just lost our singer and we're going to hold auditions and tryouts for a new singer. And that was really my entrance into like the rock and roll, punk, um, and then diving right into Trust Kill um, Records, which was like right. predominantly a hardcore label. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, I mean, it predominantly, it, it is a hardcore label. They just mm. happened to sign a couple of bands that were on the lighter side. Mm. Um, and that was re- that was really it. It was like by chance, like a weird thing. And then I went out and auditioned for them in Jersey um, in the guitarist basement uh, of his parents' house sang in a car for one of the guitarists that wasn't able to be there and then they offered me it on the spot and that was like my entrance into the the rock punk hardcore world i guess that's dude that's it's cool because um you know like i i kind of for me it was the same thing like i grew up more listening to like the like r&b like hip-hop stuff like that before i found you know, like playing punk rock and hardcore music and stuff like that too. But I was going to ask you, it's interesting you say that uh, if you had a musical theater background, because your voice has those qualities that, that sound more yeah. theatrical and like, you know, like almost like a, like a different type of stage presence than you normally see, you know, in this type of music, which is like, to me, it's awesome. Like we, we don't like to admit it publicly, but we'll just sit down together and just watch musicals Dude, and, I'm and Broadway huge. stuff all day long. So yeah. my yeah. I can't I can't really post my uh, my Spotify rap list whatever because it's just show, it's, it's literally it's show it's tunes, show tunes. <laughs> yeah. it's show tunes it's like all it is yeah but yeah um, it's I I I went to I always sang in like the church choir growing up um, and then when I went to high school I didn't want to go to the typical like all boys Catholic high school. Like it wasn't my thing. So I ended up auditioning for all of the New York city performing arts schools. And I ended up, there was this school that was just getting started called the Frank Sinatra school of the arts, which is like the most ridiculous name ever. <laughs> but so, um, yeah. so rad. I was ended up being, so my group was like the first graduating class out of there. Um, but with that, we, you know, we were doing opera, classical music theater, and actually, right before I auditioned for Bell Light, I was actually auditioning for different um, Broadway shows at the time mm-hmm. as well. Um, I was auditioning for Spring Awakening, which was like just getting off the ground at the time. I remember like shortly after that, I was auditioning for the first run of um, Spider-Man on Broadway, mm-hmm. um, okay. which like that's a blessing. Like I didn't for because that thing was a disaster when it first came out. <laughs> yeah. People were getting hurt breaking things um but yeah so it, it was interesting and people always find it interesting too because like myself and the singer that was there before me christian have very like similar like we have very big voices yeah, that yeah. you weren't normally hearing at that time from the bands that we were kind of um put in the same group with right damn yeah so per- perfect uh perfect match perfect pickup to get you feel like they just pick up where they left off kind of thing yeah um we so the the music i i've heard from uh from bed light was uh the two albums on spotify are you on those ones or mm-hmm. so i'm on uh life on life's terms which is the okay. one with like the little boy on the front cover, the yellow cover mm-hmm. one. um so they had the dawn the dawn was out which is the blue album the dawn was out before before i joined and then my first tour though was was learning all of those songs and only performing those songs is we they there was no mu- new music written mm. um and then like we kind of sat down and we're like where do we go from here with like you now um yeah. and what do we want to do they were very tired of playing that that 
type of music. Um, a lot of those instrumentals from the first album were from like their like original hardcore band that they were <laughs> before they, and they were like, we need to do something different. Let's find like a really good vocalist. Um, so a lot of those songs, like if you listen to them, like, mm -hmm. and you take the vocals out, they rip yeah. and you're like, Oh, that doesn't sound, that sounds like they could hang with like some trust kill bands. Yeah. That's why um, and I think that's what, yeah. yeah, that was like probably helpful um, for them getting signed. But, um, but yeah, so I'm on the second album. Cool. Yeah. And that's one thing we probably listen to the most. Cause yeah. And I, I was, I literally was saying like, I was like, dude, this sounds like it could be like a Broadway musical, like a rock musical. And I mean that in like the most complimentary ways. Cause it's, it's good. Your voice is powerful. It's good. Um, your melodies were really catchy. I was like, dang, this, this yeah. is, it's like it's, a rock musical. And it's, it's, fun. it's interesting because I, I actually remember hearing the first bed light Blue, for blue eyes album. Um, and I think I had actually discovered it through Roses Are Red. So somebody had put mm. me on to Roses Are Red and then like through that, remember like iTunes music used to have like, well, like kind of had like a related artist mm -hmm. section. And right, I found yeah. Bedlight like through that and was like, oh, like this sounds like it doesn't sound like everybody else, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the music sounds different. Um, and then I just remember, I remember hearing that like the dawn and then hearing the second album, not knowing that vocalists had switched. Mm. But I was like, oh, it's a different vibe now. It's a different vibe. Yeah. It still sounds really cool, but it's a different, like, it's not, like, as emo as it was before, like, yeah. if that makes sense, you know? Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, I thought, like, and, and then I was like, I, we, I need to make sure that we know which record was which so we, you know, when we talk to you, we're not <laughs> like, yeah, this, you know? Um, but, yeah, I definitely, like, I, I personally think, like, you're, I, I love the way that your, your voice kind of stands out in, like, a crowd of, like, you know, that era of music everybody kind of sounded very similar mm -hmm. and then here's these stand out like you know vocal tracks that you're like oh that doesn't sound like anybody else on trust kill you know so it's it's pretty cool <clears throat> so i had a question so so being on uh being on trust kill and sounding the way you guys sounded were some were the tours or the shows you're playing were you playing with heavier bands at the time or were you guys able to do more like a like the rock side of it um in the beginning we got we got very lucky tour wise as far as we were a like my first full us tour was was a a co-headliner with roses are red nice. and so like we were able to kind of stick with some of the lighter bands um and then as we progressed and kind of like we had to do a lot of fixing mm -hmm. um as far as when i when the old singer left and in between the old singer leaving and them finding me, they lost a lot. So booking agent was gone. Um, management was out the door. They were like, whatever. Um, and then, so we had to do a lot of work as far as like reestablishing ourselves, um, which I think we did an okay job. It was very tough being on Treskill mm -hmm. um, and being a pop band, essentially making life on life's terms was a pop record it and it was meant to be that um mm. on purpose um we didn't want to make dawn the second we wanted something because that's what we were all into we were all into we were all listening to like gin blossoms third eye blinds Sick. you know yeah. matchbox 20. we were listening to those to those bands and really wanting to do the work to kind of cross over and even cross over past a lot of the bands that we ended up touring with like you know we didn't want to write songs like from like to to compare like like a band like all time low who was coming up at that time or bands like mayday parade who like were our good friends we we ended up touring with them later on but we didn't want to write those records either we mm. wanted to be a goo goo dolls you know at, at that point in time but um it was very hard because even like you know, during touring, you'd get booked in these places and every single band, because it said trust kill, every, <laughs> every band on that lineup was a metal or hardcore band. Mm -hmm. So by the time we got on, you know, kids were like, wait, what, <laughs> what, what the hell is this? What is this garbage we're listening to? Or, you know, like we'd be given like festivals. I, I'll never forget. We were playing, um, 
I want to say it was like Cornerstone Festival, which was like a Christian festival anyway, which didn't mm-hmm. make sense for us. But we were playing with all these hardcore bands, like all of these like solid state uh, bands <laughs> that didn't make any sense. But because we were on Trust Kill, people were like, yeah, we got to get them on the bill. Um, and then we show up and <laughs> it's nothing of what they, you know, wanted. Um, so, yeah, it was hard, but like we we were very strategic and were able to like get on stuff that made sense for us um, or at least had like, you know, like we did a run with with Newfound Glory and Census Fail at one point. Yeah. There was enough crossover there of like younger kids getting into some of the more poppy stuff where they were like, Oh, these guys aren't so bad. Right. Um, so it ended up working out, but it was, it was tough being a pop band on trust Dang. Yeah. I can only, I, I, and I think that like, especially, you know, back then at that time, it was a lot harder for, for bands that, you know, are different when they come to shows, because I feel like now a, a lot of pe- a lot of people are like, Oh, cool. Like there's a different style of band on the show mm. where back then they're like, I'm going to a hardcore show and I only want to see yeah. hardcore show and I only want a circle pit and I only want, you know, and, and then when you're that, like that band that sounds different, it's a little harder to, to kind of bring people in. Um, but I mean, the fact that you guys were still doing it, uh, was, is, is dope. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. We would actually purposefully work breakdowns into our set. Um, like a conscious, like, okay, here's, here's where you'd normally do this, go into, go into a breakdown. It fits the song, but at least we'll give some of the kids at the show something they can kind of bite into, especially mm-hmm, when I was just performing Dawn songs that had a little harder edge and the Dawn had some screaming on it. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. so we were able to kind of play with that a little bit, which I think helped. But once we did the the transition to the new album, it was like, no one, no, there was no like escaping the, like, who the hell are these guys? <laughs> At that point you just got, you just ride with Yeah. Them, you, you just know? rock it. <laughs> um, yeah. We, and that's what it was. Like we had to. At, at that time. So like when you guys kind of switched to that more like pop vibe, what was the, uh, what was the climate like with, with trust kill? Were they just kind of like, what are you guys doing? Or was it, were they supportive or was it, you know, kind of like, Oh, well, whatever, you know, he might hate me for saying this because like, in my opinion, Josh Grabell from trust kill, you know, there say what you want about him, but I think he's like one of the, like the forefathers of like that genre and Hellfest and all those things responsible for that. And I mean, if you look at early trust kill, there's some of the most influential bands yeah, on there. Absolutely. Um, but the dude loves pop music and he might hate me for like putting that out there, but like the dude loves cheesy pop music. Right. So when we delivered that record, even when we started delivering demos, he was going wild about it. That's like, that's cool. Oh my goodness. Like, that. this is fantastic. Like I don't have anything like you. Um, one of the things also too, though, and and I've had this conversation with him and he knows this, so I'm not telling any breaking news. Like I also think it was it was also a it was a blessing and a curse at the same time because him not having anyone like us made him not really maybe know where we were placed in uh, on yeah. his label yeah. and what he should do with us. Right. Um so yes, they were very supportive because I think they saw that we could cross over for them and maybe break down some walls for them. But it also was, we don't always know what to, what the hell to do with you guys. Um, so touring, we were always on our own, you know, trying to find our own tour. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, us getting life on life's terms, getting reviewed on lamb goat wasn't beneficial, right? right like right. that's yeah. not beneficial. Um, us being in revolver magazine or outburn at the time, like that wasn't beneficial. So like there was some stuff that didn't make sense, some stuff that did make sense. Um, but all in all, like Josh was always super supportive of, of us. And, um, even to this day, you know, will Mm -hmm. tell me like, you know, that record is still one of the, like the best records that I've, I've put out. That's cool. Yeah. That's very cool. Um, and then, so, uh, let's kind of like, 
also like kind of step time machine step back. What was touring like back then? Were you guys uh, like conversion van? Were you you know was it bus tours? Like what what was going on back then? There there was no bus for <laughs> for us. Um, <laughs> there was when I first joined, we we were in a twelve passenger. Um, with the back with one bench seat and the rest ripped out. Nice. Um, and then halfway through my time in the band, it was we upgraded to a 15 passenger with the bench seat and the rest ripped out. Um, yeah, we never we never really broke that like we're gonna be able to get on a bus or do anything like that. Um, but touring back then and those things i like when i look back on it it was tough it was yeah. hard mm -hmm. like i don't know knowing what i know now about like mental health right i don't know how i did it how other people did it how people still do it mm. yeah. um you know this is when gas prices were low right this is <laughs> yeah. when it was affordable this is when <laughs> right people were coming out to shows all mm. the time mm -hmm. You know, even on a, you have a show on a Thursday, kids were still coming out. Mm -hmm. You know, now if you play a Tuesday show in Alabama, maybe you're playing for the bartender. Yeah. Right. And we've had, and we had those shows as well where you're playing for the other band. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, but yeah, touring back then was interesting. You know, my first tour, I, I remember map questing venue to venue, to venue, to venue, <laughs> to venue. And that's how we did, or a road atlas. Yep. Um, and then towards the end, it was like a luxury to get like the giant GPS, <laughs> yeah. like yeah. onto the windshield. Um, yeah, but t touring touring was interesting. It's 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 a it's a, an amazing experience, an interesting experience, and like an experience I wouldn't want anyone that I love the most <laughs> to have. Right. Dude. <clears throat> and I can only imagine too, because because that was an East Coast based man. Like you guys are dealing with the snow yeah. constantly. You guys are dealing mm -hmm. with more more seasons than you know. Let's say a California band that stays pretty, you know, West Coast. Um, tiny <clears throat> tiny roads. Like, yeah, it sucks to park in the city. Yeah, the, you know. Yeah, I mean, especially like you know, you play, you know, if you had a show in Manhattan or you played a show in Philly, right? You played the Troc in Philly, where mm -hmm. you're like. You're just, you know, you're getting ticketed, yeah. you know, <laughs> you know, you're getting yelled at. You have to move seven times. Your, your merch guy is moving the van more than selling t-shirts. Um, and yeah, the snow, like I can remember like sliding down hills with a van and trailer, you know, <laughs> yeah. or, or the worst part about being an East coast band was people who thought it was a good idea to start a tour on the West coast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you'd have to drive for a couple of days over to, you know, California or, mm. or uh, you know, Colorado, because that's where someone, your fantastic booking agent said, yeah, you're going to start a tour, but it's going to start in LA. Oh, oh, okay. And it starts, <laughs> uh, you know, in a couple of days. Oh, okay, cool. Well, I guess, <laughs> I guess we're getting in the van. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so it was, yeah, it's tough. That's funny. We, we were opposite because at one, when we, we, when we were signed to Good Fight, Good Fight was under E1, which is uh, yep. New York based. No, I think yeah, and um, and then our we were on Crimson booking at the time, which was also uh, I think they're they're more it's like Massachusetts based, uh, and so mm -hmm. and so and we and we this is kind of you know we didn't, we weren't complaining because we needed to grow on the East Coast being West Coast band, and so um, there was a a good two years where everything it felt like at least started on the East coast and we were doing East coast runs and stuff. And so kind of the same deal where it's like, all right, we gotta, yeah. and we, we would, we were, we were so broke that we'd have to like book our own, like mini, mini, uh, you know, D market tour all the way <laughs> zigzagging, uh, yep. cross country to, to get to just the, you know, day one of the tour. So yeah, I, f I definitely feel the whole having to travel cross country just to start the tour. Yeah. Um, I don't know how people like, I mean, I don't know if people now in like bands just starting out are like super independently wealthy or, or whatever. <laughs> right? Cause I can remember like swiping, you know, swiping my own card yeah. to get gas to the next place or like calling my parents and being like, um, you know, we just need like, 
you know, a hotel room for the night. Like, would you guys mind just like hooking us up for, <laughs> for the night or something like that? Because, you know, like eventually that, that merch money runs out and, uh, and yeah. you're not getting tour support from an indie label, you know, mm. like it's not, it's not all it's cracked up to be all the time. You know, they give you some support, but you're not always getting that couple bucks that would have been helpful getting across country. But yeah, I don't, yeah. I wouldn't do it again. That's for sure. <laughs> we kind of we kind of talked about it on like an episode, maybe like a month or so back, about how, um, you know, we had we played uh, both of our bands played up in, um, in the Pacific Northwest, right? And even just that mm-hmm. little run after not just a weekend, yeah, it's just a weekend run, right? But even just like the the trip from here to uh, Spokane in a van. And there's like no shows in between. You're just, especially now with gas prices, just swiping the card all the way up. You're like, how did we do this all the time back in the day? Like, how yeah. how did we maintain this? Well, cheap, cheaper gra- gas prices. Cheaper gas, yeah. Was, <clears throat> yeah. And then the DIY shows cheaper. all the way across the, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, <clears throat> it's, it's, I can't imagine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, being a mental health podcast, uh, I don't know if, I think you said you mentioned you watched the show. We, we like to do a mental health check. And so for anyone who's tuned in, not who's never seen the podcast before, we basically just kind of go, um, you know, wh- where are you at for the week? You know, what was your week like mentally? And if there's anything um, that you do to help you uh, or, is, or or maybe something you're neglecting to do that is maybe, you know, put you in a funk mentally. Um, so, yeah, who wants to go first? Mental health check. I'll go first. Uh, <laughs> I actually I feel I feel good today. Um, so I. I've been talking about getting back on track with like working out and everything. And so, um, I, I had my first session back at the gym this morning, um, and kind of left like wobbling. Cause I just, it's been so long since I've actually trained. Um, and so I was like, all right, cool. you like, I'll, I'll get a workout in before this episode, come home and shower and stuff like that. Didn't get to do any of that. Came home and it was like pulled <laughs> left and right all the way up until like a minute before we started this. So, but I, it's it's crazy how just being active will just give you like this like boost, you know, and like I feel just like a little sense of clarity, just being like, oh, cool, like I, I was able to just, you know, get that in today and like you know get my body moving, get everything going. So, um, <clears throat> you know, it's it's nice to to just be outdoors and be active. And I've like I've um, I've talked about kind of previously how um, I have had a gym in my house for the past like four years now. And over the past like year or so, I haven't been using it just because it's I do too much here. Mm-hmm. So it was nice to be out of the house and getting all that taken care of. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I, I think I'm, I'm good right now. Nice, man. good place. Daniel, where you, where are you at mentally this week? Uh, this week I'm this week I'm pretty good. Uh, this week was a, this week was a good one. Like how how I start every week is Monday Monday morning. I'm in therapy for myself. Yeah. Um, it's one of the biggest things people always say, do therapists need therapists? Um, absolutely. Yeah. But I also need it as a person as well, even beyond that. Um, so like this week actually was like a really good one. Like I, I touched on a lot of stuff that like took weight off of my shoulders. Awesome. Um, and I even, ex- I was explaining it to my wife. Like, um, I was kind of talking to her a little bit about, about my session and it's the first time, like in a few months where I feel like my, my jaw became unclenched, if that makes any sense. And like, I stopped gritting my teeth. Um, and it was a really good feeling. So these past, these past few days have been, have been really good. I felt like I've been able to be like a little bit more present and not, and instead of leaning into my anxiety and kind of running away from everything, um, I've been able to kind of, communicate a little bit better with my family um and find ways to be present as opposed to just kind of like scrolling my phone and disappearing right. um and kind of falling into like the gloom and doom of the internet um yeah so like therapy yeah. <laughs> therapy <laughs> is the thing that that's been keeping me in in check this week nice that's awesome and I, and i think it's very valuable for you to share that you're, you know, you do, you, you do counseling and therapy with people and then you also receive it. Like that's, that's awesome. I do have a question about that before, before you jump in. So for, for if, you know, the people that 
are therapists that also do therapy. Do you ever find yourself like kind of fighting against your therapist, like in your head, like when you're talking to them? Like, oh. um, all the time. Yeah. For me all the time. Right. Like, so I've gone through a few therapists mm -hmm. um, to find one that I'm able is able to call me on my stuff um, and kind of override those thoughts in my head. Okay. Um, yeah. I go in with a very, with a view on, on how I think things should be handled. Right. right? Because <laughs> I do it hours a day, yeah, um, every career. day of the week. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's yeah. like, I go in there and I'm like, you're like, Oh yeah. Or, or sometimes it helps me where like, I'm able to kind of find my way out of the problem while talking about it because I understand the process a little bit different, but yeah, there are certain times where I'm like, or I'll get out of therapy and I'll be like, I wonder why my therapist didn't handle it this or make me do this or talk to me toward, you know, like this, but then you just have to realize like every, you know, every therapist is not created equal, right? right like right. everyone has their own style, mm -hmm. their own way of doing things. And therapy at its best is really holding up a mirror to somebody and showing them they can do everything on their own. Um, and that we're just there to kind of nudge and push and shine a light on something. But mm -hmm. essentially you want to have someone be able to go, I get it. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, um, at least that's my style, right? We're not all created equal. That's, that's what my style is. You know, I want the person to kind of do that, but I do fight it all the time. Yeah. I, I was, I went through like two or three therapists before I found the one that I have now. Right. Um, and I think a lot of it had to do with like, I just don't like the process here. Right. I'm not sure I, I dig that. I'm not sure that's like what I'm looking for. Nice. That's cool. cool. Um, all right. So, for, uh, I think, uh, I feel like this week has been good for me. Um, I, uh, man, I, I've, I've fallen like diet for me was like a big thing that was helping me mentally. <laughs> That's been bad, but I've been managed to stay active and jump roping. And, um, I, uh, I, I, uh, I tell Mike and he kind of makes fun of me, makes fun of me for it, but, uh, I'll, I'll just do, I'll just walk around the counter at my house and just kind of mm. use that as like a form of <laughs> exercising slash, you know, thinking and, why not? But uh, I've been doing that more lately, and I feel like that's been helping me mentally. Um, you know, uh, you know, it's uh, as we're talking about this. Uh, there's something I saw you put a post up, and like, you know, like I've seen it a million times, but it just hit me differently when I when I read it. But uh, it just you had a post that said um, something along the lines of like you're enough, and mm. and uh, like for me that was very helpful in the sense that like. You know, I'm in, I'm still, I'm like in a transition period where I'm like, I'm kind of looking for a new, a new job and, uh, and, you know, I have all these different, uh, you know, what is it? Irons in the fire and I have all these different things going on and I'm, you know, it's hard not to think like, oh man, I should be, I should be at this point right now or I should be, mm -hmm. I should be doing this more. I should be doing that. And, um, and it was kind of one of those things to, you know, not that I want to just sit, but it was nice to be able to like, be like, you know um it's like i'm good i'm good today you know and uh you know i know i know the effort i'm putting in and it could always sure it could always be better but uh i'm i'm trying and i gotta at least appreciate that about myself that i'm at least showing up and so uh yeah so i think i think i'm good um these uh we, him mike and i we have like we like everyone we all have big plans for next year so I think I'm I'm mm -hmm. trying to really focus on just being like right now things aren't that crazy, and I think I'm trying to appreciate that and just be okay with with uh, you know where I'm at right now. So yeah, with things being kind of calm. Yeah. <clears throat> um. So okay. So I so um we talked about the music side. Um. I'd like to know you know what what got you into your profession now? Like when uh when did the schooling for this go? How did work come about? Um, if you can kind of give us an update or just kind of give us that, that, that path. Um, I think for me, it was, I worked in, when I first moved up to Massachusetts, 
I worked in special education and I worked in a middle school in a sub separate classroom. And I kind of saw how much work there is to be done. Um, and you know, I was, when I first went to college before I joined bed light, I was, I did like my first year of college and that was important to me before I joined the band. I was like, just let me finish my first year. So at least if something happens, I can go back into school and I have like my first, my freshman year done. Right. But at that point I wanted to be like a music teacher. I wanted to be a, a music performance major. Mm. Um, and then when I first moved up to Massachusetts, I wanted, I was like, Oh, I'll be a special education teacher because that's what I'm working in. That's what makes sense. And like three schools later, um, I decided to get my my bachelor's in just psychology. Um, still didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and then really what, what made me switch to mental health was it was really me thinking back to the band and thinking about what meant the most to me in the band. And the thing that meant the most to me was connecting with people, human connection conversation um i was always the person at the merch table i was always the person in the parking lot talking to every last person who would want to talk to me and i realized how much of an impact you can make just by having a, a, an open and honest conversation with somebody um so i ended up finding um at this point in my life i was um married with a kid and couldn't go back full time couldn't you know, I couldn't even go like I did the night class thing for a little bit. That wasn't my my scene. I was like, I'm falling asleep. I got to drive home at 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. This is not my thing. So I ended up finding an online um, graduate program and, you know, worked my butt off, D you know, was doing classes every six weeks, um, a different class every six weeks to kind of um, get through it. And it ended up being a fantastic experience um, of just like really wanting to help people because I saw how how much work there is is and and still is mm -hmm. to be done in the area of mental health, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to kids, um, but also but also adults and mm -hmm. people like me who who need just someone to talk to, right? Like you can't always talk to your wife or your parents or your partner or whoever it might be. You need someone that's just going to sit there and listen. Yeah. Um, and I thought I could be that for at least somebody. Um, and 50,000 clients later, like I'm, I'm able to be that for, for a lot of different people, a lot of different age groups and, um, it's definitely one of the one of the I hold it I hold my my path in mental health in the same regard I hold being in my time in the band where I feel like it's kind of like sacred work mm -hmm. and and something I hold very near and dear and protect very mm -hmm. much um but yeah so that's that's kind of how that went like online school is the way to go at this mm -hmm. point being in my being in my thirties and having a kid and at that point needing to work full time. Um, it got me through it. And, and now I'm just, I'm out in the field doing my thing. Dude, I love when, that. When you were in um, like special education, like what age range were you working with at that time? <clears throat> so I was in, I was with middle schoolers. So, you know, transitioning from like fifth to sixth grade and then, um, to eighth grade. Okay. So I guess that's like, I don't even remember how like old you're supposed to be 13, in those grades, 12, but like 12 11, to yeah, 13, like 14. Yeah. And that's those pivotal middle <clears throat> school is those pivotal years where that's when like bullying starts. That's when yeah. kids start to be very cruel to each other. That's when kids start to like find things out about themselves. Um, and I was in a very, um, like the school and the town itself was very low income. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of, um, 
uh, separated families. There was a lot of poverty in the area. So it was just, and no one was doing anything about it. And it drove me nuts, um, especially in the schools. Schools, a lot of times things get swept under the rug. And if you are part of the PTA, um, your kid doesn't get in trouble um, for certain things. Mm, yeah. And kids get locked in windowless rooms when they're bad. Mm. Um, there's a lot you see that like parents, if you're listening and you have a kid in middle school, check on your kid um, <laughs> and, and see, because sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes the adults, the adults in schools are the biggest bullies. Um, and mm. that was something that also drove me to that wanting to be able to get to these kids that like, you send your kid to school for like seven hours a day and it's not always fantastic. Right. Sometimes it's the most miserable experience where they're being traumatized, where they're being bullied. And then I get them after that and, un and have to undo a lot or help them undo a lot of that. So um, yeah, the middle school age range is pretty tough. It's a tough one. Yeah. And, and the reason I asked too is, is I was curious, is there w like what that, what that experience was like, especially if you're dealing with special ed um, classes, you know, like w that age range, like, you know, like as somebody who, as a kid, I got picked on quite a bit. Right. And I can only imagine, especially when you go into the special um, education range as well, like that bullying and that type of, you know, like, you know, and some of these kids aren't able to articulate or aren't able to express like mm -hmm. how it's making them feel or how, how it's affecting them. And I'm, I'm just kind of curious, like how much of that you saw and how much of that was like, you know, really prevalent in, in that time. Cause I know that even for me as a kid, like I didn't know how to explain that. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm upset cause my teacher put my desk in the hallway so I could finish my homework <laughs> while everybody's watching movies, like mm. shit like that, you know? So that's, <clears throat> that's one of my, that's one of my biggest, that was one of my <laughs> biggest, like, boiling points at mm -hmm. when I was working in a school was seeing the kid out in the hallway, separated, and isolated <laughs> from the group. Yeah. And I would, and, and, you know, it was one of those things where you have to be so, so on top of it. Um, because even the people who are trained to deal with kids, you know, kids in special education don't get it right. Yeah. all the time um and there are a lot of teachers that aren't trained to deal with that and there's also not a whole lot of communication right like mm -hmm. open and honest communication to kids where like you're not allowed to talk about it in school you're not allowed mm -hmm. to say words like autism in school or um even now like you know like with mental health like you're not it's not talked about mm -hmm. it's talked about in other ways right we spent years and years of doing a health class and teaching yeah. kids how to like look at like a, a food pyramid or be like absolutely mortified at their BMI because that mattered when you were 12. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we do less and less. So, you know, it's super hard. You have to be super aware like of what, you know, how you can best advocate for those kids um, and, and how you can help them within the, the, the bubble of the school district and the school, because you're constantly fighting against that. Mm -hmm. Um, you're constantly fighting against administration. Um, and my whole thing was, I was always kid first. I didn't care if I lost my job because I was protecting a kid. And at the end of the day, I ended up losing that job because I was protecting my boundaries and kids boundaries and i went out you know in a blaze of glory um, <laughs> knowing awesome that like yeah. knowing that like i was shining a light on things that weren't getting done and weren't happening and yeah you you just have to like stay on top of it and and really get to the core of like what's going on in those mm -hmm. situations with those kids and if they can't advocate for themselves, you have to be the loudest voice in the room for them. Yeah. And, That's cool. and it's, you know, like you said, it's so true. Cause you know, a lot of times, you know, people with just, you know, lack of education or just, you know, they're so used to doing things one way and it's, you know, they, they don't realize the damage they're doing. Um, mm -hmm. at my, at the last facility I was working at, um, 
you know, we ran into that a lot, you know, and, and a lot of credit to the, my, my main, my main boss there. She, she would every now and then be like, you know what? I don't, I haven't been training this in a long time. I, I'm so used to doing things my way or doing ways that I know. And, um, just like little things like, uh, you know, you have a kid who has severe anxiety and like when they get out of school, you know, they, we kind of like, we were kind of bombard, bombarding them, like making them having to do all kinds of stuff. And it's like, can we let this kid like just chill when he gets home? Like, can we, can we let him just like collect himself? Like he just was at a place where he's, you know, that he hates, that already. he hates. Yeah. And he, you know, he's, he's, he's taking, you know, all kinds of anxiety things. And it's like, can we like let him just chill for a minute? And before we like make him, right. we ask all these things with them. And so, yeah, it's, it's a, it, I can imagine just, having to constantly go to battle but like you said you, you you put the kids first and so it you know if nothing else at least you have that as your your uh i don't know what to call it barometer or whatever it is to so know where you know am i doing the right thing it's like well if you're doing if you're if your intention is like the focus of the kid then i feel like you'll always be in the right even if it doesn't follow <clears throat> policy and and in a lot of cases outdated policies at these schools so Yep. Yeah. It's and and just to think back, like on school, you know, when we were when we were kids, like nobody talked about mental health or feelings. Oh no, no, never. I didn't know what. I didn't know what like anxiety was. I didn't know mental. I didn't even know that like special education existed when Mm -hmm. I was in school. Like I didn't, you know, like I was always the kid that was like, you know, out of his seat and Mm. in the hallway and walking around and getting yelled at and getting put, you know, my seat got put next to the teacher's desk, you know, in front of the teacher's desk. And then, you know, I was spent plenty of time out in the hallway or, you know, somewhere else, you know? So it was like, it was one of those things where like, I mean, even when, if we're, you know, if we're going, if we're fast forwarding, like going into like high school. And even when I joined the band, there was no talk. Now it's like, bands are more willing to be like mental health, anxiety, depression. Right. Let's talk about it. Let's, mm-hmm. you know, let's write songs about it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you listen to that, that life on life's terms album and really dissect like some of the more, the heavier songs, a lot of it is, is rooted in like mental health struggles at the time of a lot of different band members. Um, and what we were going through and like, that was like the first time, like, I think like, I was like, huh, I might have something, something going on here because I was always like, oh, you're just supposed to kind of feel sad at this, right? Like, oh, you're just supposed to kind of dust it off. Yeah. Walk it off. And if someone makes, (laughs) yeah, if someone makes fun of you, like, yeah, it feels funny, but I don't know what that funny feeling is. And really it's like, oh, I'm going to think about that in 20 years Mm, because of what that person said (laughs) or that, that teacher said to me, um, but I'm glad it's getting talked about now. Yeah. You know, something that I, I didn't think about until much, much, much later. Um, one of my first times seeing Half Heart, uh, was in 2000 and I think it was 2008 or 2009. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd listened to their music. I thought they were a cool band, you know, nothing, uh, like they weren't that big of a deal to me, but in, uh, in their, their, uh, watch me rise there's a it, it's a quick part and it's here and deliver it live i heard it and it hit me and i didn't understand why it hit me i was like why did that hit me and it's the line of uh to the slaves of depression carry on and that's the first mm-hmm. time i'd ever heard anything about mm-hmm. anything remotely close to mental health <laughs> you know in in music or at least maybe maybe if i had it, it just went over my head yeah and i was like why did that hit me just because I don't have depression. I mean, yeah, whatever. I get bummed out about stuff, but so does everyone else. Yeah, I've thought about taking my right. life, but so does everyone else. You know, like that's, you know, I just wasn't even on my radar. And it, I didn't realize, um, like I like, I like made my eyes like walled up and I was just like, why is that hitting me? I'm not, I'm not depressed. I'm not sad. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah. and uh, it's, uh, it's interesting because there, there's definitely that era, even, even in this music where it's supposed to be more open and emotional. Right. But there it was almost like we could talk about feelings and, and, you know, and emotions and anxiety and stuff, but we had to do it in code. Mm. Right. Like, so you'd write these songs and you wouldn't know that you're necessarily talking about your anxiety. You'd like 
make your anxiety like a like a villain in a story right. or something, you know, where it was just like, yeah. I'm actually talking about depression, but mm -hmm. we're formulating it in a way that, you know, everybody can understand. It's like a movie, you right. know. So now that the fact that it's more in the forefront is I, it's definitely good, you know. Um, I still think that there are some people who may take advantage of the fact that mental health is a is a is becoming more popular in a sense or like more on the rise but i i still think that there's a lot of genuine um you know people singing about or singing or talking about you know things that are that are true but you know <clears throat> i i think anytime there's something that Unfortunately, mental health is, you know, is trendy, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Like you go on TikTok, there's there's influencers that aren't trained professionals that are influencing people in mental health. And are their intentions pure or do they want to get a, a brand deal right. or do they want to get some sort of check? Right. Even even I remember coming up like there was always thoughts of like, people making money off of other people's struggles right mm -hmm. um one of my favorite songs is and i don't know if it's directly about this but there was always rumors it was by a band called envy on the coast and it was a song called the great american t-shirt racket mm -hmm. um and there was always rumors that it was about um to write love on our arms when that got huge in the scene right. i mean you couldn't go to a show that didn't have the original shirt yeah. or you didn't go to Warp Tour or Bamboozle and see a booth and a wristband and mm, all this yeah. stuff. And it was basically just like you're making money off of other people's pain. Right, um, right. And I think anytime you, you have something that's at the forefront that people with big voices are talking about, there's going to be people where their intentions are pure, where they really want their peers to get into therapy and talk about things and and I think the biggest thing is you want that kid who comes to your show or adult that comes to your show to feel comfortable enough to go, that dude's talking about it, then I can talk about mm -hmm. it. And if that guy, if that guy or girl is able to say, you know what, I go to therapy, then maybe they're going to go to therapy, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think at every single show, there should be a booth with pamphlets about how to, uh, your local resources of how to get to different things and you're holding each other because i feel like you either do that or you want to do that it's it's something that we've been discussing quite a bit lately um it's know. it's one of those things where why do why does anyone go to a i mean at least when i was going to shows right or why does anyone go to that show because it was an escape mm, yeah. from whatever they were dealing with for that couple hours for that 45 minute set they were able to put away the abuse, the trauma, the thing, and have it be that place. So why not cultivate that space mm -hmm. and say, hey, here's a resource for you to get help. And it's okay for you to have this idea here because we're going to help you as people who have big voices mm -hmm. and have a responsibility where, you know, some bands maybe don't feel a responsibility, but I feel... If someone's buying tickets to your show, buying tickets, uh, buying merch, you know, supporting you, you can have that somewhat responsibility to say, yo, it's okay for you to feel this way here. And it's okay to ask for help here. Right. Um, I always said, um, and I know there's a couple artists doing it now, change the meet and greet, change the meet and greet to a, to a group therapy session, mm. you know? Talk about anxiety at shows. Talk about depression. Talk about those things. Instead of having a kid spend their whole life savings on meeting you for four seconds right, and yeah. getting a merch pack, have them view you as a human. Yeah. Have them That's view cool. you as a human and break down that power dynamic of I'm just like you. And I get help so you can get help. And let's create a healthier scene. Let's create a healthier place so that like, we can keep this going. And I think the, the connection that the fan to artist will, that that'll be cultivated there will be amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's cool. And my, my, uh, you know, the reason I was doing that is cause you know, uh, the last, the last little, the last bit of my time, full-time touring, 
um, you know, I was talking before, after the show, and it was, you know, different things, you know, but mostly mental health related things. And this is before any schooling for me. I was just, um, I was someone who had lost, I was just a dude who lost a friend to suicide. And I just mm. ranted on stage. And I did that for years, <laughs> for years, basically. <laughs> and, um, you know, and so, and a lot of my, uh, my talks with people, mostly just listening, you know, cause I, I was like, I don't, I'm not qualified to hear anything you're telling me right now, but I, I understand that I might be the only person you're speaking to. So, you know, let's, mm -hmm. have, let's, let's do it. Let's have this conversation. So, um, the thing that changed was, you know, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not licensed right now, but I, you know, I graduated uh, my degree in social work and, um, I didn't realize the difference in my conversations now with, uh, with people from, uh, the shows that we did, uh, in October, it was just a weekend run, but you know, it, it was just the conversations felt different in the sense that whenever somebody would share, you know, whether it was depression or, um, they had previous thoughts of suicide and things like that, like, uh, my my question to them was like hey do you know your resources that are available to you in your mm -hmm. area you know and just little things like that so yes yeah, so we, we were we've been there's some things in the works that we're trying to do to kind of uh do that have something physical that you can take with you you know like yeah appreciate the message and i think people listen. don't know yeah. people don't know right like people you know, I don't know the age groups that come to your shows at this point, right? Like, mm -hmm. but even if even if you're 16 or you're 30, 40 years old, mm -hmm. you know, it's not easy all the time to access that information right. or find that information or feel confident enough to get that information. But if you're someone that they look up to or care about, says like hey you know what we got into we're playing you know ida B boise today mm -hmm. and we knew before we started this tour we looked at every city we were going to and got all of the resources and created pamphlets or created whatever or, or contacted them and had someone come with a with a table and instead of you know, and hand out their information mm -hmm. yeah. um I'd love to be able to create something where people could get like 15 minute free consults at shows, yeah. right? Like, Hey, talk to this person. They, they're going to tell you like, Hey, like, I think this would be beneficial for you. Here are your resources. Like, here's what you're dealing with. Here are some resources for you because some people need immediate, right? Mm -hmm. Some people might go to that show. Like you're, you, you know, <clears throat> you, you said suicide, right? Some people might be going to that show and they might not go home. Right after that show right they might need that that intervention right then and there mm -hmm. and man wouldn't it be wonderful if just that pamphlet was able to give them that hope that curiosity that they need to continue right mm -hmm. um and i think i just think it's it's so important to know resources know where you can get help mm -hmm. i mean obviously 988 is a is a thing now where yeah. you can call just like you would call 911 yeah. um and get immediate mental health um help um but yeah i i definitely think there people need to know where to get help yeah yeah and i think that um like kind of like part of the idea of this show really was like you know it's a mental health podcast we don't always talk strictly mental health like we'll just go on tangents we'll talk about things but you know our the main basis behind it is just like making it just as casual as possible mm -hmm. to really just express yourself and talk about things mm -hmm. and i think you know, people being at shows, like we always say kids being at shows, but anybody really yeah. uh, being at shows, you know, um, it, it, like you said, it's an escape. Like it's an opportunity to just, hey, for, you know, a few hours tonight, I'm just going to chill, listen to some of the bands that I like, listen to the music that has connected with me. And then why not have that ability to say like, oh, cool, like, you know, hey, and if you're struggling with anything, if you're dealing with anything, like here's here's some resources for you. Here's some things that you can look into, you know, yeah. or even so. And what I like about that too, it's, you know, even if they're, even if you're not the person who's like going through it yourself, right? Like everyone yeah. has a friend, you know, that, cause that's, mm -hmm. that's a lot of what my conversations are too. Like I have people reaching out, you know, for a friend, you know, or they're like, Hey, mm -hmm. how do I talk to this person? Or like, or they'll tell me, Hey, can you, re can you reach out to this person? It's like, <laughs> yeah, I can, but um, yeah, you know, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, 
it's it's an area that I you know like you've mentioned it 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 has more attention now. Um, it, it it is kind of trendy, which is cool, but there's still so much so much work to do, and there's a lot of um, you know I I don't want to I don't want to just be I think I think um, I don't even know if we've had this conversation, but like you know it's nice to like have songs about it, and I and I'll talk about it on stage, but. I just don't want it to end there. And I can't just rely on having mm-hmm. people come to me after the show. Right. You know, as, you know, as, as cool as that, as that is. And, and I, I always, it just, it's still, it's still humbling and blows my mind that when someone is willing to come and talk Oh yeah. and share that, Absolutely. you know, it's like, that will always blow my mind, especially, you know, even when I rewind to when I was touring and, you know, I was a guy in a band that never, that never finished college. You know, I was, you know, so I'm like, who I'm, you should not be talking yeah. to me. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm not someone to, to, you should be speaking with, but you know, I always admire that courage to just share. And so, um, I'm glad that, uh, I'm, you know, I don't know faith wise, but I, I, I'm always thankful that I, even though I didn't really know it at the time, but I was always acknowledging that as a strength right away. Cause it is to be yeah. able to, sh- to, to reach out and, and, uh, you know, make that, you know, the, even if that's the only step they take, um, you know, I just wish, I, I wish, you know, obviously looking back on it now that I could have had something for them, like tangible to take home with them. And, and, uh, hope, um, I know that moving forward, uh, at least on our, on our end, we're going to, we're going to do some things on our side to kind of help that. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping that this podcast becomes something that, uh, allows us to have conversations with someone like you, you know, I've, I'm, we're going to, we're going to definitely be talking a lot more after this podcast, which I'm excited about. Absolutely. Cause I'd love to pick your brain about things. And, um, you know, I just, uh, yeah, I, I want this to, you know, to grow and become, you know, something like, uh, you know, we are, are funny. It's not funny, but our, our slogan is, you know, normalize checking in on the homies, but that's, I, I saw, I saw the shirt. I saw the shirt. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's so important, right? Like mm. when, and, and like, I don't know if this will, how this will come out, right? Like in, in, in words right now, but mm. like, especially guys like you, right? Like when you think of like no bragging rights, right? Or like you, you turn on that music, people have this preconceived notion that you're supposed to be like these tough guys, yeah. right? And like, the fact that you're willing to sit there and go, no, 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 listen, like you can have tattoos, you can do all of this stuff and still check in on yourself, check mm-hmm. in on your friends, be there for each other, you know, because isn't that what the hardcore scene is really, it got muddied along right. the way when I think of like going to like banner shows in New Jersey and yeah. like, <laughs> all of those things, you know, like right. worrying you were going to get like really harmed. Right. Um, as opposed to like, that's what the scene is about. You're right. supposed to take care of each other. If someone falls, you go and pick them up. Mm-hmm. Um, and like to rewind a little bit, like you might've not felt like you had, like you wish you could have given them more, but like you said, like at that point, that was enough for them to just be able to talk to you the person that they looked up to. I still have saved emails for, and saved notes over the years of being in the band of people that were like, Hey, like I was sitting in a car ready to, you know, ready to end my life. And I popped your music in and I'm so glad that I did because I turned the car around and went to the hospital. Mm. Um, and like in those moments, like, you know, number one, that's super heavy. And like, I never got into it at that point to have that responsibility. Right. Um, but like you said, at that moment, it was what they needed. They got something, they had something and thank goodness they did. Yeah. Right. So like, whether it's a song you put out, whether it's the 10 minutes you took before or after the show, whether it was you willing to say, you know what, I can't help you, but I know someone who can. Mm-hmm. Because I do that all the time and in, in, in my work now, I have friends hit me up, people in the scene hit me up, 
and go, I know you live in Massachusetts and you can't do this, but like, I'm struggling and I need help. Got you. Mm. I don't need to be from, you know, Texas to, to help you. Yeah. I, I, I can find you something. I can figure it out. I never, there are so many therapists that don't read their emails and don't talk to people, which is like a thing that pisses me off. Um, that they'll just like let an email go by. Um, yeah. I answer every single person. If I can't be your therapist, I will help you find something or understand what you need and get you to the point where you are. And that's like, like you're saying, like having the information for people that come to shows is getting them to that, maybe that next step that maybe you can't help them directly, but you can get them somewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and then, um, so is that, that was kind of the idea behind like your, basically your new businesses that you're, that you're starting, right? Like the, um, the, the companies that essentially you're, you're working for. And then can you tell us a little bit about those? Like, you know, what you're doing with them? <clears throat> so I kind of, so right now I work full time at a group practice. Um, that is, a fantastic practice with fantastic people. Um, A lot of them um, are like expressive arts therapists. So they do a lot within like movement and art and music and things like that. Um, So that's a fantastic practice that I'm at. That's kind of like the full-time gig. Um, But with my other stuff, so I'm never comfortable with where I'm at. I always want to do more. I always want to create. I always want to put something out there. Um, So I created Mind Noise, which was built out of connecting with like people on Twitter who I really look up to that are, they might be in marketing, they might be in different, um, different areas of mental health or business. And what I was seeing was I was like, there's not a whole lot of therapists that look like me. Um, when I was going looking for my own therapist, I'm Mm -hmm. like, there's not a lot of like young guys that look like me that like, I want to talk to. Right. Um, and so I was like, I want to somehow get into like helping people in the music industry, in the arts industries in the sports industries, things that are kind of close to me. Um, so I kind of just like was like, you know what, I'm I'm just going to go for it and do like a kind of like an education consultation sort of business. Um, and I kind of just like, like hit the ground running. It's still in the baby stages of like me under like wanting to really figure out where to go with it and what I want to do if I want it to be this like business business or do I want to turn it into something that's like a nonprofit where I'm able to do other things with it as well. Um, but basically like I want to help people in the industry get help. Um, but I also want to help labels, management companies, um, really understand that like, like how you treat your bands, how you treat your staff, how you, market, how you put things out into the world, all should have some sense of lens on it that is is looked through the lens of mental health, mm. um, especially when a label is dealing with a band that's mm. out there grinding and yeah. they're treating them like a piece of meat mm. and feeding them to whoever. Um, is that band happy? Are they Are they healthy? Are they okay? Um, They could be the most profitable band in the world, but we see all the time that 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 isn't always a good recipe, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I think most most notable and recent for me is like Chester from Linkin Park, right? No one, everyone was like, wow, like we, we didn't know this. We didn't see the signs. We didn't do this. For me, it's like, where's the label? Where's the management? Where's this? Where's that? But did they know? Did they know enough? Did they have the education to understand that they needed a break? Mm. They needed this, whatever they might have needed. I don't know the story, but 
I just want to be that because I've lived this experience. Um, I know what it's like to be on tour in a band. I know what it's like to be in the music industry for, you know, well over 12 years now from being in a band to being a solo artist, to being signed to an indie label, being signed to a major label. And like, it's, it's, it's shark infested waters out there. Yeah. So if I can help anyone navigate it or just help facilitate for people, right? Like, I just want to, I just want to help people. Right. So like, that's, you know, like locally I'm doing what I can with, with my full-time job, but I want to affect more. Mm -hmm. And my noise is my way of talking to people like yourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Talking to management companies, labels, um, and just kind of seeing where they're at. Like, how what's what's your mental health what's your what's your mental health strategy at your label and i think sometimes nine out of ten times they're That's gonna go well yeah we have like a, a we we let them know that they could go see a therapist hmm, okay all right how's that working out you know and mm-hmm. it's not and i think we need to like we need to break down those walls right we need to be honest and say I don't have all the, I don't have the answers here. Help me. Um, because I think a lot of people in the music industry, especially we have all the answers. We're good. We got it. We have therapists. We have this. That's wonderful. But that ad campaign you put out there is super inappropriate, right? Like this, this thing that you're doing, this band is moving in a way that's not appropriate for 2022 right? Like the, the way that it's being portrayed, the way that things are happening. Um, so I just think like, I always want to create and collaborate and, and just help where I can, especially in the music. Cause it's in the music industry. Cause it's near and dear to my heart. And, and I said it in a tweet, I think not too long ago, like if you were in a band from the, if starting in like the, the two thousands, you're probably in deep into therapy by now. Um, <laughs> because you didn't take care of yourself and you Mm. didn't realize all the damage that you were doing until you became an adult and realized, Oh, it's, it's okay to go see a therapist. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) You got, you got your uh, producer notes over there. I mean, that I got to get in my questions that I had. Um, We let, we let Mike run a little bit of the producer side of things because uh he likes to get nice and organized <laughs> <laughs> well this i feel like feel like you gave me more than what i was like even looking for as far as um you know anyone who knows me will tell you i give more than anyone ever asks for it so <laughs> that rules and and you know i'm i'm like i said i'm we'll, sure we'll talk a lot more off camera and stuff but uh yeah i mean anyway i can support whatever you're doing um it's it's you know, for for the stuff that we were we've talked about and things that I've been passionate about, my 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 passion has always been the hardcore scene, just because you know I was so connected to it, and and uh, I just felt like people don't realize, um, you know, for it being like a very you know violent scene, very gang affiliated, <laughs> very you know all that stuff. Um, when you talk to people, there's a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of you know a lot of people that are searching and and hurting and. Um, and, you know, I just, I always felt like it was, that just scene in general is so, it's so, um, uh, it's like a population that's not, that's not, um, not looked after because I think in a lot of ways, you know, people think, oh, well, you know, it's a lot of tough guys, a lot of strong guys, a lot of, a lot of men in there, a lot of, yeah. you know, strong women and stuff, which is true, you know, in a lot of ways, but also, you know, it's just, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of suicide in that scene. There's a lot of, you know, mm-hmm. and not just showgoers, you know, we're seeing it now. Like, you know, there's, you know, band members that are, you know, you're hearing about them, you know, people taking their life. And, and so, um, yeah, it just, I really, I really admire what you're doing and I'm excited. I'm excited for, for, for uh, mind noise and what you do with it. Cause I think that's, it's so needed, you know? And 
I know you're going to hit a lot of resistance, I'm sure, with a lot of <laughs> a lot of labels, and I'm sure bands, because like you said, you, it, yeah. you know, it, we have everyone has it figured out, you know. I felt like I had everything figured out. Um, my first, one of my first true uh, therapy sessions that I went to, I went because I just wanted to see what it was like to run it, and I was like, just so I can get notes for myself, because I didn't need mm-hmm. it. I was just like, yeah, I'm just going to go. Yeah, I, I don't need this. Yeah. And then, of course, I walked out of there just like almost in tears because I was like, oh, man, <laughs> I didn't realize. <laughs> yeah, I was... you, don't, you don't realize it sneaks up on yeah. you. But it's it's one of those things where it's like I just urge people to just be just be open to to communication. Right. Mm-hmm. Like let's let's all continue to have conversations and not think that, like, we know better than the next person. Right. right. We can all learn from each other. Um, even if you are doing a good job, like let's still talk, right? Like labels, management companies, like let's still talk and connect. And because if everyone had everything figured out, we wouldn't be seeing the, the numbers that we're seeing, right? When, Mm. if you took a poll right now of all of the active bands in the scene about their mental health, I guarantee you'd be astonished by the, by what you were seeing. And, And then if we ask the bands, what is your label doing? What is your management company doing? Um, what is your booking agent doing? They'd probably go, nothing really. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Maybe the manager is doing a little bit more because mm-hmm. there's a little bit more closeness there, but like labels, you know, are they? So like, yeah. let's just like, let's help people, you know, like let's, let's connect and help people and, and, put all the other stuff aside and like, make sure we're like saving these young people's lives, you know, and, and putting them in the, putting them in the right direction to get help. Um, if they need it, when they need it. Um, but yeah, like I totally agree with the hardcore, you know, the hardcore scene, there is this misconception. Um, there's always been a misconception, um, with the hardcore scene, you know, like I didn't know much about it until I was on trust kill I didn't know much about the hardcore scene until I was like, oh, I can get guest listed for this show. Sweet. I'm going to go to I'm going to go see Terror and Throwdown, you yeah, know, yeah. like and then I'm like, oh, interesting. But little did you know, like I've spent time in like hot tubs with those with those guys, you know, like, yeah, um, yeah in my label owner's backyard. Hmm. And they're they're humans, yeah, right? Nice like dudes. everyone's a human. Yeah. yeah. Nice guys, humans like need the same help that we all need so i i just think like you know going forward like like you said we we all need to connect with each other and and if we can all help each other out on the way there like what's the purpose to help so let's help it's not for us to like be these self-serving money-making machines yeah money is nice obviously but like why are we doing it? Why did you write the song? Why did you join the band, right? To find something, to connect with something. Right. So let's continue to do that. And that's that's what my noise is to me, is continuing what I started in the band, which was human connection. Yeah, that was very cool. Awesome. Um, um, well, uh, I was, I was going to say, we can... Uh, I'd like to just like kind of end with just a little... Just little basic questions on uh, like coping mechanisms. Um, one of the questions we get quite a bit is, you know, it's the holidays and, uh, just any, any advice you would have for someone who's, um, how to, how to basically deal with, you know, if, if the holidays are a difficult time for someone, what is some, you know, little tips or advice that you would give to them? I definitely think, um, I mean, obviously depending on what you're struggling with in the holiday season, um, I know sometimes a lot of times um, grief is is a thing that people struggle with, especially around the holidays. I know I struggle big with it. Um, and what I do is I, you know, I make sure like talk to my therapist, communicate, um, communicate with those around you that you trust. Right. Um, and let them know how you're feeling and how you will be feeling mm-hmm. um, and really find those moments to, whatever your thing is, if, if you're, if you go towards meditation, yoga, um, those things, schedule those things into your, into your time. Um, it's the Christmas season right now, find days of the week where you can check in and do those things, those, those coping skills. I'm big with journaling. I love to, I love suggesting journaling to people, um, getting thoughts out in front of you. 
and out of here and in front of you. And sometimes when we read those thoughts over, we go, Oh, okay. I know how to deal with this. Or I know who to talk to now. Right. Mm -hmm. Check in with yourself. It's called the sanctuary model. It's, um, what am I feeling? Where am I feeling it? And where can I get the help? Right. Mm -hmm. So understanding what the emotion you're having is during the season, the holiday season, where you're feeling it and who's going to be able to help you. Sometimes it's you, sometimes it's your partner, sometimes it's a it's a friend. So doing those things, if you're struggling, I know a lot of people, they get together with family. That can not be the grandest of occasion. Set your boundaries, understand your boundaries and where you need to set them with those people that aren't um, filling your cup. Mm-hmm. Um, and And also, again, Take time for yourself, right? Self-care is not selfish, right. right? Taking care of yourself is not selfish. It's you, the, the term is you can't pour from an empty cup, right? Mm. So you need to do things that are filling your cup and taking care of you. So you're able to be present for, for the things you want to be present mm. for. Um, so I, you know, I always suggest just kind of, you know, checking in on the homies, right? Um, and understand and checking in on yourself and really and really understanding and then giving yourself a break having self compassion during during these busy seasons understanding like like we talked about it's okay for it for you to be enough it's okay for what's happening to be enough mm. um and you don't need to go the extra mile to to do anything else you can just have what's in front of you be enough but I would suggest anyone who's not writing, put those thoughts on paper, get those thoughts out of your head, get them in front of you so that you can, you can see them and you can understand like, Oh, that's pretty negative. How could, how could I deal with this instead? How, how could I flip this? You know, Mm -hmm. flipping those negatives into, into different things. And, Oh, I did this. I wish I would have done this, write it down so that the next time that happens, you know, Oh, I, I want to do this. You know, I want to do this instead of this. And then and then work on that. But yeah, taking taking time for yourself. Self-care is not selfish. And self-care isn't always like bubble baths and bath bombs and, and pedicures and manicures. Sometimes self-care is like sitting with headphones on and listening to a band. Mm-hmm. Or self-care. Self-care can be whatever you need it to be. Um <clears throat> So just take, you know, just taking the time to check in with yourself and, and understand like what it is you need and where, where you need to get that help in, in these busy seasons, because they can sneak up on you. Yeah, for awesome. sure. You know, it's funny for the, the journaling is awesome. And I, this is kind of like a, like, I don't know, I guess funny in a way, but um, I had somebody that had written, written to me and they reached out and uh, it was over the weekend and I just didn't get, I didn't get around to it. And they'd written me a long paragraph of what they were going through. And before I, I was reading it for the first time and they had written another response and they said, you know, I, I read through what I sent you and I kind of realized some things that I had, I didn't realize were, were pressing on me until I read them in front of me. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, and you were like, that's why I waited to get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> A wizard is never, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it, it's so important. Like, because you don't, it sounds different in your head. Yeah. It sounds so different in your head. Mm-hmm. When you get it in front of you, or if you talk to a friend, you start to hear it, or they hear it, mm-hmm. and they go, "What? Yeah, like what are you talking about? Like this isn't do this instead of this, yeah. or you know, you look at it and go, this is how this is what I'm feeling. Shit, like this is an easy right. thing for me to deal with. Like I can I can fix this, or man, I didn't know this was a problem. Okay, like I need to I need to." go a little bit deeper here. So I I think, you know, those things sometimes getting, getting between these, between the ears is sometimes the most, the most dark place in your life (laughs) and getting it out, getting that darkness out and putting a little light on it is, is sometimes all all you need to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I know that that uh, we've kind of asked a bunch of the questions on our side, and you did send us one that somebody asked on your side, which is, um, you know, essentially, what's your biggest personal struggle in your day to day life? And then to kind of go on top of that, like, how do you cope with that? How do you work through those struggles? Um, <clears throat> so for me, day to day, it's anxiety. I am 
I sometimes, and the people who love me most will tell you I have crippling anxiety um, to where, and it's like, I laugh because I'm like, I'm a therapist. Yeah. Like I shouldn't, I, I help people understand this and I can't understand it. Um, and with that comes me not being able to be present for my wife and my daughter, which is a killer for me. Um, it's one of those things where I can always tell, um, when I'm in sort of a, a, a not so good place when my daughter, like I can tell my daughter doesn't like me as much. Mm -hmm. Um, she doesn't want to be around me as much. Um, and I can see that I'm disappointing my wife with how I'm acting. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's like the biggest day-to-day struggle is just my anxiety and thinking, you know, thinking I'm not good enough, thinking that I'm not a good dad. I'm not a good husband. I'm not a good son. Um, and feeling the guilt and shame that comes along with that. How I deal with that, number one, is getting my butt to therapy every week. Um, number two is um, finding better communication, um, communicating my feelings and not keeping people in the dark. Um, because oftentimes when I'm able to have the conversation, I'm able to either help myself or someone else is able to say, Hey, why are you worried about this? This, we can do this. We can do this. Mm -hmm. This is okay. Like I can take the burden off of you a little bit. Um, so, you know, doing that and really just trying, trying to be more present and intentional with my time, Mm -hmm. intentional the whole week. Why am I doing this? What is this for? Um, And part of me is one of those things where like when I do that, I'm able to smile and feel a lot more like who I feel I am um, and who others know me to be. Um, And, you know, like the, like I said, like the past couple of days, I felt like I've unclenched my jaw. I felt like I've had genuine laughs with people that I wasn't having. Um, and I owe that to therapy, but I also owe that to finding a way to communicate to the people I love Mm -hmm. that this is what I'm going through. And I might not be able to spin it around and do a 360 and do cartwheels in the backyard, but at least, you know, and you can kind of put your arm around me and go, all right, Like you got this, like you're good. Hey, like something, something changed, like what's going on. Uh, And then also me being open to that. Right. Um, I always come from a place of defense. Right. I I come from a place of like, wait, you're telling me I'm, I'm, I'm being, Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not doing this. Mm -hmm. That can't be, I'm going to find everything about you that pisses me off and tell you all about it. (laughs) Um, And that's not appropriate or correct. Or healthy. So being open (laughs) Yeah, like mm. being open to to hear that you're not being present and you're not being intentional and being willing to say, what do I need to do? What do you need me to do to best support you? Or what do I need you to do to best support me? Mm. So that's how I deal with the day-to-day struggles of of a giant anxious fool that I am. <laughs> Very nice. Um, and then, uh, before we kind of like jump out of here and then, you know, if, if we, if we want to stay like kind of after the show and hang out a little bit and talk, we, we can do that. But, you know, while we are still recording. So, um, as far as music goes, do you have any, uh, solo projects that are, that are on the way? Any, um, any plans with a band maybe? I mean, you know, any, anything on the, um, on the horizon for you? I dabble here and there. Mm -hmm. Um, there's no serious plans ever. Yeah. Um, I definitely think like my being in a band or anything like that or pursuing it for real is kind of that that chapter is closed mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't be opposed to like, you know, do it having like an online presence and then yeah. doing some like local stuff when mm-hmm. I when I felt 
like I was confident enough again in myself to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, so no like plans on the horizon. Like I'm always willing to like collaborate with people, um, get in a room and write, um, all that stuff or a virtual room and and write. Mm -hmm. Um, so like no foolproof plans, but like music's not totally out of my life. Right. Um, it's always going to be there. It's always going to be like the driving force in my life. Um, but right now I don't have like any, any official plans or anything like that. But like, if you're someone with music and you want to collaborate, <laughs> hit me up. Uh, yeah. And, <clears throat> and then just my, my last, my last question. And, uh, I, I kind of want to do this cause we, we, our plans for the podcast is we like to also get, you know, people in the scene, whether bands or whatever, and, uh, you know, talk about their experience with music, which we've got to do. But my last question for you would just be, um, if you could, if you could go back to when you were in the heat of your, of your time touring, what would you either tell yourself differently to do to protect yourself mentally or, um, or just, yeah, or, or just what would you do, um, differently? Or maybe you were doing things back then that were helping you mentally, but, uh, yeah, what, what was something that, what's something that you would do or what, what advice would you give yourself to, to help yourself mentally, I guess? I think if I was able to talk to myself, I would tell myself to set boundaries, um, clear boundaries um, with the people in my band and elsewhere. Um, and I think I would have also told myself to um, communicate your needs better um, instead of just kind of always kind of going with like, yeah, sure. Let's yeah. Okay. Mm hmm. Yep. You guys know better than me. I mean, I was 18 when I joined the band. So I was a, I was a baby compared to the guys I was in the band with. Mm. Um, they were a lot older than me at the time. So like, I was always kind of like, yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Whatever we want to do, whatever is going to go. So I wish like I would have had more of a voice, mm. um, in certain situations. Um, and there's always a part of me, and this is like a selfish part of me. There's always a part of me that wishes like maybe when we ended things that I would have had the mental strength to continue on or see what else was out there instead of kind of falling down a spiral of, this is over for me mm -hmm. and I have, I'm not going to ever do this again. Um, where I would have had the men, like the strength and the support to go, no, talk to your, talk to your, what are you doing? Talk to your label, talk to this person, talk mm -hmm. to these people. Like, don't just fall into this hole and, and not do it. Like where, like I was still young at that time where I could have done something right away or, or whatever it was. So yeah, I, I think I would have set boundaries and just been like a better communicator and kind of had a, a a bigger voice at certain points of the band. Right. Nice. Awesome, man. Well, dude, Daniel, thank you so much for for coming on and and uh, talking with us. I guess we should also be thanking Matt for yeah. for connecting us and and uh, yes, yeah, man. Yeah, this is this is awesome, dude. Yeah, we really appreciate you. And I know that <laughs> I know that we were kind of a mess getting all the scheduling together and and com communicating back and forth. But you know, thank you once again for coming on, man. This is awesome. Yeah, we're still figuring absolutely. This thing I out. appreciate you, <laughs> dude. So absolutely, um, I appreciate it. <clears throat> uh, do you want to plug any uh, social media? Do you want to plug any um, you know contact information, anything like that? <clears throat> um, you anyone could hit me up uh, if you're looking for help in the in mental health or anything like that just because you're far away doesn't mean i can't help you um daniel rinaldi music at gmail is is a good way to contact me it's kind of the one that i look at the most okay. um and social medias are d rinaldi music twitter all that stuff um i don't actually know what the handle for my noise is but if you go to I, there's an underscore in there somewhere and i don't know where what the hell the underscore is um uh, it looks like it's mindnoise.co yeah mindnoise.co so if there you go, you go to that um there's a lot of like um you know cool quotes and things like that um 
that's kind of what mental health social media is Mm -hmm. at this point. It's Mm -hmm. kind of like fun quotes and fun fonts, Mm -hmm. but yeah, like anyone could always hit me up on any of those things. Um, talk mental health music. I'm always willing to talk to anyone about any of that stuff. So, um, yeah, hit me up. Awesome. Yeah, dude. Once again, thank you so much for this. And we'll, uh, we will definitely, I'd love to talk to you again, uh, sometime soon, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, we we can chill Absolutely. a little bit after this, after the show, so we don't want to just jump off right away. But you know, for now, we'll say thank you so much, and we'll you know we'll see you guys soon. Peace. Bring it back again!